Hello and good evening. My name is Michael Maluli and I'm part of the Alumni Relations team here at Trinity College Dublin. I'd like to welcome you to our webinar tonight, Innovating in Times of Crisis, How Trinity's Young Entrepreneurs Are Adapting Their Businesses. This webinar falls under the Inspiring Ideas at Trinity series, a webinar series for our times. I'd like to welcome our speakers this evening, Liam Booth, President of the Trinity Business Alumni and host of this evening's webinar, as well as our three fantastic speakers, Lizzie Hayashida, Amy Louise Carton, and Candice Lafleur, all of whom are shining examples of the impact Trinity alumni are having in the business world. And you'll hear more about all of them momentarily. This evening's webinar is being hosted by the Trinity Business Alumni, Trinity's largest alumni affinity group, and we thank them for their involvement. Staff, students, alumni, and friends around the world, thank you for being here this evening. Your continued support and involvement is what makes this community such an amazing part of the Trinity experience. Before we begin this evening, I have a couple of technical points I want to get through. If you're listening in on Zoom, I, there's a couple of items I want to draw your attention to. First of all, if you want to enter or exit the full screen view, you can do so at the top right of your Zoom window. If you want to ask a question at any point throughout this webinar, and we encourage you to do so as we go along, you can do so by clicking the Q&A button at the bottom of your screen. Finally, you can adjust the audio settings on the bottom left of your screen, and you can leave the meeting for any reason by clicking on the bottom right. If you're listening on Facebook Live this evening, hello and thank you for being here. You can mute and unmute your video by clicking the audio button on the bottom right of your screen, and we encourage you as well to comment with any questions you have for our panelists and they'll be passed along by a member of staff. So, I want to just briefly go over the format of this evening before we get started. I am going to introduce our host, Liam Booth, in just a moment and Liam will then in turn introduce our three speakers for the evening. Each of our speakers will then give a short presentation on how they and their businesses are innovating and adapting during these times of crisis in their relative industries. We will then have a Q&A section moderated by Liam Booth. And I encourage you, like I said, to be sending in your questions throughout this period, and we'll feed those questions then to our panelists. And we aim to be finished and wrapped up in about an hour's time, finishing up at around half eight. And now it is my great pleasure to introduce this evening's host, Liam Booth. Liam is the Managing Director of Investec Corporate Finance, a role he has held since 2012, having previously led the corporate finance team at NCB following the buyout of NCB from Ulster Bank in 2003. He is also I would like to introduce now to you Liam Booth. Thank you very much, Liam, for being here with us this evening. Thank you, Michael. And it's uh, my pleasure to be, uh, thank you, Michael. It's my pleasure to be hosting uh, this evening's uh, webinar on behalf of the Trinity Business Alumni. Um, just a few words about the, the, you know, the, the TBA. The TBA is for all graduates of Trinity that are involved in business, regardless of the academic discipline that they qualified from, from uh, Trinity with. It is a forum for alumni to connect and network to learn and to contribute to the development of business, college, and wider society. We look to aim, we aim to, to achieve these objectives through a series of events, dinners and camera, masterclasses, uh, mentoring and sponsoring of a number of student events, including the Trinity Student, uh, Business Student of the Year Award. Earlier this month, we, an we announced the 2020 winner of the Business Student of the Year Award, and that was Sinead McAleer, a fourth year computer science and business student. Sinead not only had achieved academic excellence, in fact, quite brilliant results in, in, throughout her, her, her time in Trinity, but also had found, found the time to start a medtech uh, business and also contributed significantly to, to the Trinity Access Programme. At the TBA, we get to organize and host these events thanks to the support we obtained from our corporate partners, namely Accenture, Bruin Dolphin, HSBC, The Irish Times, Mason Hayes and Kern, and my own firm, Investec. From a business perspective, most of us are now working from home, but realizing now 
more than ever, the importance of staying connected to clients, colleagues, friends, and of course, family, and therefore using our networks to the best effect. Dealing with this crisis and planning for the recovery will only benefit from collaboration and sharing ideas and experiences. At the, at the TBA, we're having to adapt also, and that's why we're delighted to be in, you know, involved in co-hosting you know, this evening's uh, webinar along with the Trinity Alumni uh, Office. And um, tonight's uh, webinar, webinar, I think you'll find extremely interesting, innovating in times of crisis, how Trinity's young entrepreneurs adopting their businesses. So this evening, it's a privilege for me to be sharing the stage with three outstanding entrepreneurs whose businesses are not only very successful, but also bringing about a hugely positive impact on society. So on to introducing our three speakers. And they are, in order of appearance, uh, Lizzie, Lizzie Hayashida, co-founder of Change Donations, changing the way we donate to charities through its digital platform. And Lizzie holds an MBA from Trinity. Lizzie will be followed by Amy Louise Carton, co-founder of Keep Appy, the app that helps you take control of your daily well-being. And uh, Amy is a holder of a, a degree in sociology and a master's in entrepreneurship from Trinity. And finally, we will hear from Candice Lefleur, founder and MD of CR Robotics uh, and creators of Milo. Milo is a robot designed to support people living with dementia, a personal robotic home assistant, as it were. And Candice also holds an MBA from Trinity. So without much further ado, it's on to the main event, and I'd like to hand over to our first speaker, Lizzie Hayashida. Thanks so much, Liam. Um, so hi, I'm Lizzie Hayashida. I'm the co-founder and CEO of Change Donations. Um, as Liam mentioned, I completed my MBA, um, and actually it's during my MBA that I met my co-founder, Will Conahan, and we co-founded Change Donations. So it's very much a project that came out of Trinity, which was fantastic. Uh, so what Change Donations does is we help charities and nonprofits fundraise in a digital age and connect them with today's generation of donors. So we are doing this by allowing donors to link a debit card, round up their purchases to the next euro, and then donate their digital spare change to the causes that they care about most. Our goal out of all of this was to be able to give everyday donors a way to give every purchase they made a purpose. So if you can imagine, you're going for your morning coffee, it's two euro 85. Um, our platform lets each donor automatically round that up to three euros and donate the additional 15 cents to the causes they care about. Um, so now that you have a little bit of background on Change Donations as a company, um, I wanted to take this time to talk a bit about um, the charity sector in general, some struggles that we've seen and then how we've adapted as a company to fill some of the needs that have arisen from COVID-19. So to start out, I think um, when we think of the effects this has had on the economy as a whole, in general, people have thought about how, how COVID-19 has affected businesses. Um, but the, the pandemic and the subsequent countrywide lockdown has also had a major impact on the charity sector as a whole. So in many cases, this has affected the way they're able to deliver their much needed services. Um, and of course, it's also had a major effect um, decreasing their fundraising activities. So an example of this, um, just the other day, we heard of a charity that was, um, that provides support to children and families in vulnerable situations. Um, an essential part of their services was being able to visually see a child. So of course, with the lockdown, this is extremely difficult to do. So in a, in a matter of weeks, they had to adapt to being a fully digital service provider um, and change their operations significantly. So now they're able to virtually check in with children and families, um, providing this extremely important service. Uh, but this has not only changed the operations um, of the service itself, but also added a huge cost to equipment um, and training staff on the two tools necessary to digitally connect with the children and families. And I think that is one of the big hidden costs um, that people don't 
don't typically think of when they think of the effects this is having on charities. You typically think of the fundraising day is potentially lost, but there's actually a huge um, upfront cost that comes with converting to a digital first um, service. And then of course, um, on top of figuring out how new service deliveries um, can be made, charities are also faced with um, deferred or canceled collection days. Um, on top of things like marathons and different runs being canceled, which is having a huge financial impact on them. So silver lining on, in all of this is that uh, people are coming together as a community. Um, there is a huge focus on sort of collective giving, um, crowd fundraising. So that has been a fantastic thing to see. Um, and we've seen, I'm sure everyone's seen things like the um, run five, nominate five, give five trend, um, the 100 laps by Captain Tom Moore. So there's been a huge call to social media to help with fundraising. Um, but what we've seen is charities that aren't specific to COVID-19 or healthcare have still had a hard time really connecting with, with donors at this time. Um, so when we looked at the general trends going on in the industry, uh, we talked to our partners about the issues they're facing. What we realized is, what we realized was um, that there are a few main things that we as a company could help with. So one is um, the charities are, a lot of them are early stages of the digi their digital journey. So helping them find ways to connect, um, explaining ways that they're able to do, you know, Zoom calls, very kind of basic things. If you come from a technology background, we're actually able to help a lot with. Um, the second was um, helping them break through if they're not COVID-19 focused. And then the third is just, of course, fundraising in general. So as a result of these um, things, we've shifted our focus as a company um, from focusing specifically on fundraising and donations to helping charities adapt it more generally to a virtual world um, and sharing our learnings with them along the way. Because of course, we're learning um, to be 100% virtual as well. So the first thing we've done is um, we've pivoted to become a, more of a holistic charity partner versus a fundraising charity partner. So we've begun to offer charity support in areas outside of donations. We started creating um, a weekly email and blog series around working from home best practices, free tools, some of which are specific to the charity industry. Um, we've also become a source for charities to find grants um, other, and other aid they have access to during this time. The next thing that we've done is um, after talking to a lot of our partners, we learned that many are struggling with marketing and messaging. So um, they're seeing a lot of, as I mentioned, successful crowdfunding campaigns around COVID-19, but they're not sure how to get their specific message across in the same way. Um, the services they provide haven't, um, the need for them hasn't gone away. So many of them don't have a full-time marketing person in house, let alone someone focused on digital strategies. So as a result, we started building a charity, we're calling a charity toolbox, which contains custom content for our partners. Um, that includes video, social media, and other marketing related items. Um, we're also, we've made this a two-way communication tool. So they're able to upload files they'd like us to work with. Um, and it stays within their own kind of charitable ecosystem. So we're really trying to help them in outreach just generally. And then I think the last thing is really in terms of fundraising, you know, we're fortunate to be in the position that we're able to provide a digital solution to help charities continue to fundraise. Um, and with tapping becoming commonplace, our digital solution really helps charities um, in this specific time. So we're well aligned for the climate. Um, and while we used to be attractive to sort of early adopters, we now need to be more commonplace for the everyday donor. So we'd heard from charities from the get-go. Some donors are, you know, they still want to donate in cash. Um, it's a, it, they're, they're donating during the typical collection days. We now need to reach those donors that weren't typically um, comfortable necessarily donating online. So to help with this, we've been working with charities to create educational content about donation methods um, to first further explain what roundups are. Um, and also to explain, you know, we have boost functionality as well, so they're able to give in all whatever way meets their um, their donation interests. Um, and now we're kind of we're looking for ways to be able to reach those both fast followers and slow movers, so beyond the early adopters that we were going after to start. 
So as a whole, um, you know, we've seen this, it's a difficult situation for, ev for everyone. Um, I think us personally, we're really lucky to be in a tech company making us more easily adaptable to remote work, um, a bit more nimble when it comes to reacting, reacting to market trends. But on top of all of that, it's been really inspiring um, to see all the charities and how they've displayed, you know, digital kind of aptitude and getting up and running um, when they really didn't necessarily have a lot of background in that to start. So it's been really fantastic to see. Um, and, and I think, you know, we're lucky that we get to see fantastic, inspiring stories every day that come out of those charities. So um, yeah, I think in general, we're adapting well, um, lucky to be in the space we're in. Um, and thank you so much. So speaking of inspiring stories, I will hand you over to Amy from Keep Happy. Thank you, Lizzie. Um, also, like Lizzie, we are very much a Trinity startup. Um, I did the Masters in Entrepreneurship just last year, and it was there that I met my co-founder, Will Ben Sims. Um, and together, we decided to go on this mission to make preventable, preventable wellness tools accessible for all. And that's where we created the idea of Keep Happy. So Keep Happy is a gym for your mental health. It's a toolkit of preventative teacher, uh, uh, preventative features that help you take control of your well-being every day whether it's journaling goal setting tackling your mood with a gratitude diary or just feeling a little bit more in control of your stress that's what keep happy is there for um so when covid began i think i felt very similar to a lot of people out there where i really really struggled i completely felt blown over by uh, covid19 i did not expect how low my mood would go as quickly as it did. And I felt really out of control. And I remember reflecting on this one day and, and really questioning why I had plummeted it as much as I had. And when you think about COVID and what this has done to us, it has completely disrupted our routine, our daily way of life, our connections, our physical connections to one another, and so many other components of life before this. So in a way, a lot of us were mourning a way of life without really realizing it. We also were faced with financial insecurity, economic insecurity. So many of us faced a whole new future where there was just so much uncertainty, it was hard to control it. And it really took me time to adjust from a personal level. And, and while my co-founder was able to do amazing things and, and he kept everything going and he made sure everything was okay, it really struck me how much it had impacted me. And then I started thinking on it further how one in four of us suffer from a mental illness and yet it wasn't just people who were mentally ill that were suffering and struggling. So many people online were complaining about feeling bored, feeling unmotivated, losing their ability, their ambition, their drive. And this is when it really struck home for me because it wasn't just one or two people, it was everyone. And then the statistics started coming out where 30 to 50% of victims of domestic abuse were call, uh, there was a 30 to 50% increase in domestic abuse call centers. We saw seven in 10 people in Ireland struggling with un, unexpected levels of stress every single day. And it really drove home how significantly this has impacted our mental health as a community. All of us are experiencing it. So I started looking more into it and very quickly realized that 30 to 40 percent of first responders after 9-11 still struggled with PTSD 10 years later. 20 to 40,000 people enter into emergency departments in the US every single day for psychiatric purposes. The reports that we are getting from frontline defenders, the nurses and doctors, the people who we needed most, we were starting to hear reports of suicide. We were starting to hear reports of tragedy of mourning, of bereavement. And I'm not sure if you're aware, but bereavement, economic instability, and uh, isolation are the three of the leading causes of mental illness. And with all of this going on, all this chaos, all this noise, Keep Happy, at Keep Happy, we knew we needed to do something. We knew that this was a tsunami coming, that a mental health tsunami was coming. So we decided to do as much as we could. And while we still give an, a version of the app away for free to people who are struggling with their mental health, and we are a social enterprise, we cut our prices across the board by 50%. We really put our mission of making these preventable tools first and foremost. They had to be at the core of everything we did with COVID. 
And even then we were unsure because it didn't feel like we were doing enough. This crisis meant that people were going to be struggling. And that's when I got in contact with a close friend of mine, Travis Atkinson, who's the president of the Crisis Residency Association in the US. And I was asking him, like, what are people doing? Like, how are you preparing for this? Because in Ireland, the amount of, uh, the amount of crisis homes and psychiatric wings was very much under control. The Mental Health Commission, although calling for reports of additional PPE for more uh, tests, they, they seem to have things under control. And that's when it really came to head for me that in the US they were not prepared for this, but more than that, they weren't prepared for the crisis responders and how they were going to deal, it from, deal with this from a mental health perspective. So what we decided to do was we created the yellow pages for mental health crisis responders. Um, it's called covidmentalhealthsupport.org. And we brought on over 700 helpline centers across the US in just three weeks to join us on a mission to make this pathway to mental health care clearer. Because what we realized was that crisis residencies were getting shut down. Psychiatric units were being forced to reduce numbers due to a reduction in, or due to social distancing. Helplines were losing volunteers and the actual pathway to getting help was being completely disrupted. So what we ended up doing was creating this website. We brought in this coalition of helplines of organizations and together we decided that it was more than just making these tools accessible. We had to explain to people how to get to these tools, how to get to these helplines. And then we're also in the process of putting this all on the app so that these tools are once again, even closer to your fingertips. So while it was this incredible journey of me not feeling great and realizing that other people probably didn't feel great, we were able to transform and very rapidly lean on people's good intentions and goodwill during this time to create this platform that has really, really helped people. We're having hundreds of people call helplines through our service every single day. And this was just people coming together and wanting to do good. And it's really wonderful to see it how by putting this out there, by talking about mental health, by constantly bringing this up, more and more people are coming forward and, and recognizing that they're not feeling alone, that the weird dreams that they're having are not random, that most people are experiencing them, that the struggles that loads of us are experiencing, it's okay to feel that way during a crisis because you know it is a crisis, we're going through this. So it, it's been an incredible journey from not quite pivoting, but bringing in people to help us, bringing in partners to expand our reach, to really make a positive impact and to act as a bridge during this time where crisis responders are just not able to be as on the ground as they once were before. So I think really what we experienced during this time was the fact that anything really is possible so long as you, you, you really put your mind to it and have the passion and determination. And I think just realizing how much goodwill is out there during this time. So it's my pleasure now to introduce the next speaker. Uh, Candice is absolutely inspiring, so I can't wait to hear from her. Hi, very nice to, very nice to be here, very nice to meet you all. My name is Candice LaFleur and this is Milo. Um, and again, it's lovely to be here. Thank you very much for having us. I'm just happy to be invited. Um, it's difficult to follow those two. Those are some really fantastic, some fantastic projects that are really making an impact. Um, a little bit of background. Uh, I, I built a robot. Uh, he was a direct result of, I had a major stroke when uh, about six years ago. And it came out of nowhere, and I was the youngest person on the stroke ward for, by a good 40 years, for at least two weeks. And uh, all I remember is this massive loss of independence. I had, prior to that, no background in healthcare, no, no background in tech. I had been working in Chinese media um, for most of my life. And suddenly my world had turned upside down, and I had this massive loss of independence. I couldn't hold things. I couldn't remember things. I couldn't remember what I was supposed to be doing. I couldn't recognize people. I, I couldn't hold my phone and therefore I couldn't communicate. And that, that was such a feeling of being robbed. And the worst part is I, I was still there for two weeks, but I didn't need medical intervention. They just wouldn't let me go home because there was no one to make sure that I was monitored. 
24 seven. I, I couldn't go somewhere where if I fell down, no one would know, or if I, if I had another mini stroke, no one would know. So th that was a pretty painful experience. And then it had always stuck with me that there must be some kind of tech support that can help with this. And the only thing at the time that I could find was an oversized TV remote control, which wasn't exactly gonna cut it. So it kept at the back of my mind and it wasn't until I did the executive MBA program at Trinity that I started to put the idea together and I started to build a team and we built a robot to help. So yeah, as you do. Um, so Milo is essentially a home monitoring and companion robot. And as Liam had said earlier, we built him to help people with dementia. We want people with dementia to be able to stay in their own homes as independently as possible, as long as possible, and to reduce hospital re or reduce rehospitalizations. Now that's all well and good until COVID-19 hit. And suddenly there were all these different uses for Milo and we just got bombarded by, can we use Milo for, for autism supports for kids in homes who can't even access teachers right now? Can we use Milo um, in adult group home settings because they can't get their staff? Can we use Milo in a care home because we can't get people going into those isolation rooms? Can we use Milo in a hospital so doctors can avatar in using a phone app and then they can talk to patients and they can engage with patients without having to put themselves at risk? And it was a matter of trying to decide as a team, a small team, how we were gonna deal with this, which way we were gonna go. So what we had done is we decided that the HSC is where we do our testing, where we do our researching. So we pulled all of our international interests back so we could hold our stock to be available in Ireland for the HSC to deploy wherever we want them to go. We changed our team structure, which is I think everybody's having to do right now, especially with working from home, but it's, it's a little harder with robots too, because now we have to have robots in everyone's home and we have to have them here and there and everywhere. Um, and then we, we thought that was all well and good until we started having more problems of then how are we going to get Milo into someone's home? Because we would normally have a, like a 45 minute installation period. So someone wants a Milo for their elderly parent. Great. We'll come, we'll deliver it. We'll set them up. We'll hook them up to the internet. We'll show you and your family how to use them. We'll help the watch. And now we can't go into someone's home because it's for a vulnerable person and we're we're presenting a risk by bringing it to their home. But then also, how do you drop off a robot at an 80 year old's doorstep and hope for the best? So we we really had to come together as a team and reach out to people at Trinity and reach out to people at other organizations. How can we do this? So we've been focusing on how to get in places without us having to be there. And that's that's been a real challenge because not everyone is, is very tech savvy and not everyone's very comfortable with this kind of tech, even though we've tried to make Milo as simple and user friendly as possible. It can still be a bit daunting if you literally have a robot dropped off at your door with an instruction manual saying call us if you have an issue. Um, but that's essentially what we've had to do. We're excited that we can use Milo in so many different ways, but it has certainly pulled focus from where we were going and what we were doing before. And that's that's been a real challenge for us. Um, we've been starting to use him at hospitals. So like I said, he can be in an isolation room or an isolation ward. Families then can use Milo to avatar in from their phones and they can be at that bedside. So when you avatar into Milo, your face shows up as his face and you can see, you can see what he sees, you can hear what he hears. And so for those families, we're all hearing horrific stories that they can't be there if someone really needs them in ICU or something, we can do that with Milo. And it's a matter of getting around all of the procedures of putting that in place. It's, around, it's about getting around GDPR issues and everything just to make it work. Because during this pandemic, we just have to make it work. There's, there's no time to sit back on your heels and think about, well, should we do this? And can we do this? And, and how do we do this? It's just go and we'll figure it out later. So for us, this pandemic has been, it's been tough for everybody, but it's been pretty wild for us um, because we're trying to help where we can and we're happy to help where we can, but there are so many areas that need help right now and so many ways to go that that's been our, our major challenge. So, yeah, that's me. That's Milo. Back to you, Liam. 
Thank you, Candice, and, and thank you to all of the, uh, all of all three speakers, just those amazing stories to tell and that we could listen to for a lot longer. But, you know, we have a number of questions that we would like to, to put to the three of you. Um, and uh, if, I, I'm, if I may, if I might just put one that's, you know, got a slight Trinity bias to it, but I, I sense a real entrepreneurial vibe in Trinity these, these days. Um, in a sentence from, from, from each of you, um, how did Trinity influence or shape your thinking in starting your own business? Um, I, I guess I can start. Um, so we actually started Change Donations in, my co-founder Will and I, we were put on the same team with, um, with five other Trinity MBA students. Um, and our first project in our entrepreneurship module was uh, to, to figure out, uh, to figure out a, a company and start it. Um, so it was started kind of notionally, but um, myself, my co-founder Will, and then uh, like the whole team, like we were so excited about kind of making this go forward. And I think from the very beginning, um, two of us really knew this is something that we wanted to take further. Like we could see how, how impactful it could be. Um, and Trinity was fantastic. So from that initial, those initial project days, um, after that we went on and we applied to LaunchBox, um, which Amy was in as well. Um, and that gave us phenomenal uh, mentorship and guidance and they connected us to the right people that we needed to know to kind of move the business forward. Um, we met our first investors, Elkstone, from um, from the LaunchBox program, so that was incredible. Um, I think just and also just going forward, um, since then, you know, they we ended up going on winning the LaunchBox program. Um, that gave us space in Dogpatch. That's connected us with a, a, a ton of um, resources and um, helped us network. And um, both myself and Michael Finder Will are both American, um, and so just being able to be connected into the Irish startup ecosystem throughout through Trinity was an in, incredible um, benefit from, from going through Trinity. Amy? Yeah, so I think for me, it's actually really funny because Lizzie and Change Donations and myself and Keep Happy have really similar stories in the sense of how it progressed. But the starting point for Keep Happy um, began with my own personal journey with mental illness and my recovery and identifying a gap in the market. And I decided to do the master's in entrepreneurship to scale up, to be able to enter into the business world because my background had been in politics. Um, so for me, it was really interesting to join this new world of business to get introduced to it. And there in my course, I met a guy who was into rugby. I was not. I didn't even understand why they threw the ball backwards, let alone forwards. He thought I was some social justice warrior who was obsessed with politics and obsessed with being, you know, very left wing and, and all this kind of stuff. And we kept being put together on these projects. And we kept winning these projects together. We would win the class competitions. We would win the course competitions. We'd year, win the year. And we just worked really, really well together. And we balanced really well. And this, of course, was my co-founder, Will Ben Sims. And he unfortunately shared his own, he, he shared with me his own experience with mental illness and his family's experience. And it was just this perfect synergy of us being co-workers before we were friends even and like we just knew that together we could create something and very similarly to, uh, to Lizzie as I mentioned we got into LaunchBox we we were very we had an amazing experience there we were lucky enough to then get the free office space in Dogpatch as well which has just been extraordinary for us in terms of introductions and connections and being able to build up our brand and we just kind of went from strength to strength and it's been an incredible journey since then so it really did start with trinity finally candace yeah milo certainly started to take shape with trinity as well um and kind of along a similar theme i i the executive mba i finished in 2017 which seems really long ago now um but in the executive mba it's hard not to push an idea forward because you're surrounded by all these people in business, your classmates, your, your professors, the people they bring in, you're surrounded by data scientists and design leads and marketing specialists and how everyone is so eager to share that resource and to share what knowledge they have and be a part of something that it would almost be, 
you'd have to try not to grow an idea. Um, Trinity has been fantastically helpful and supportive and they'll make introductions, but it's, it's the same with the people that you have in your class. They've been invaluable and, and I still contact at least a few of them once a week to say, hey, what would you do about this? What would you do about this? And I, I couldn't have done Milo this fast, probably at all, without doing that MBA there. Okay, well, that's very yeah, great to hear that the Trinity has uh, capable of that inspiration and uh, well, you're all fantastic uh, sort of representatives of it. Um, some questions now from uh, from the, the, the floor. Um, Amy, if I just, uh, one for you. Do you think this pandemic will permanently change the perception and discussion around uh, around mental health and, well, uh, and wellness? God, I hope so. <laughs> it's time enough, like we need to get on it anyway. Um, I actually do really believe that it will. I think this has really woken the world up to the impact of mental health because there is a really big difference in the conversation around mental illness and mental health. One in four people may experience a mental illness, but every single person in the population has mental health. We have good days and we have bad days, just like with physical health, we have good days and bad days. And it's really important that we take ownership and recognize this. And it's really interesting with COVID because the physical health component has really been put into jeopardy. It's been taken away or, you know, with isolation where it's been reduced. So everything is about mental health. And I think that really, and I hope it really does make a lasting impact. So yes. Okay, thanks. Um, Lizzie, one for you. What, what, what can people who are no longer in a position to help charities financially, you know, if they can't help, no longer can help financially, what, what can they do and in, in, what would, advice would you give to, you know, that they could practically help charities during this, this, do, uh, during this time? Yeah, I think um, even beyond just helping, so, so one is, um, I mean, we've seen a lot of people kind of putting their, their skills or hobbies to use to provide um, necessary, you know, create, create masks or sew masks or um, help deliver food to people that maybe can't go out and, and get some if you're able to do that. Um, so I think there's a lot of things you can do um, within the community and um, even even if you have skills so if you so like one like i mentioned earlier um a lot of charities don't have someone that's able to do kind of digital media for them if you have skills that you're able to kind of volunteer your time with that is huge and that can make a huge impact for for charities great thank you um candace um, do you think the pandemic and social distancing will lead to increased focus and funding for automation uh for the robotics industry I think it's, I think it's going to have to, I think, I think a lot of things are going to change and some of them may change for the better. Uh, some of the changes that we're all experiencing now, we're starting to like quite a bit, such as working from home and we may not need such large offices. We're also starting to see that how can we make our elderly family members more independent? How can we protect them more? We're starting to see more of the risk of people coming in and out of the home constantly. Um, we're also starting to see, as, as Amy was saying, mental health issues with older people who are having to cocoon and stay at home who can't use a smartphone. Um, they, they're going to need some kind of option for that. I think automation, there's, there's a lot of talk about how robots are coming, right? Not a lot of people realize how many of them are already here and how many of them are already making a positive impact. So. I think that's going to keep getting bigger and bigger, and I'm excited to be a part of it. Great, great. Amy, um, question that, that's sort of just addressing the, your, your, your wider efforts, more recent efforts in, in, in response to COVID. You mentioned the goodwill of people willing to come together to build the required pathways to resources. Uh, but the question is, but goodwill doesn't always result in efficient outcomes. How do you manage, how do you manage to get results? Yeah, that was a really tough thing for me to be able to navigate. Um, I got described as a young whippersnapper at one point, which is a word I'd never heard really before. So it was kind of a funny experience. I came into this uh, organize the coalition, the group of uh, crisis responders and tech solutions, very much with the intention of getting it out in a week and just going as quick as we could, move at the light, like speed of light, and 
I really struggle to recognize that things need to take time with larger organizations. We're working with the largest helplines in the world uh, throughout the whole process. They had to obviously manage stakeholders and their own reputations. And it is something I struggled with, but I think everyone was so determined in the coalition. We are all so determined to see a solution come out and, and it's not finished. There are still things that we need to add to it and improve, but it was really, I actually do think it really was the goodwill of everyone that we were so determined we could see how much of a crisis was coming. We saw the increase in calls to the helplines. We saw how serious things were getting just across the US. And this was all happening along the same timeline of things escalating over there. So it, it really was just, there was a lot of urgency from everyone to get it done. And that's really how we managed to do it in the end. Great, thank you. Uh, Lizzie, this is a question from you, someone who's obviously been researching your CV. Um, with the experience of business startups in, on both the West and East Coast of the USA, how, how does the Irish startup landscape com compare? Um, I think uh, it's totally different um, in the sense that, like, I'm from San Francisco, and I think people are much more open to new ideas being possibility. Um, whereas here, there's a lot more skeptic skepticism, um, which is actually, funny enough, one of the reasons why I wanted to come to Dublin. Um, because I think you get a much more realistic view of the general population. So when people give you feedback here, they're, they're, they're I think, much more representative of um, everyone versus San Francisco, where I'm from, where kind of everyone will try, try anything. Um, so yeah, I think, I think it's very different, but I think it's very different in a, in a good way. Um, and then in terms of collaboration, I think it's, it, it feels like San Francisco kind of maybe 10 years ago in the sense that it's not all tech here. So you get a good mix of different people with different perspectives. So you're able to really um, get a broader view of the world. Um, and, this, and the startup community is still um, just a subset of, of the, the general population. And so you really are more of a tight knit community, which I think is fantastic. Good, thank you. Um, one here uh, from, a Simon who's working in HR a function and his question is HR that is just a question for, is how can the how how can the HR function help young entrepreneurs grow and grow better do I, any of you want to to uh, tackle that one have you relied much on on HR to date or as your businesses grow how do you see the HR functions sort of growing commensurately uh, with them it, it's hard because well, in my own experience, yeah, my business is growing, but not just in Ireland. I've got, my, my team consists of people in China and India and Romania and Poland and Holland and Canada and Ireland. And it can be very difficult to keep up with what you need to do, but you don't want to limit yourself to just one country anymore. So HR is a challenge. I'm not sure how to solve that. I'm in the robot industry, not the HR industry, so I got no answers there. But it is a problem for us because it almost feels, as a startup now, it's more natural to grow in a multinational type of way. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And that brings lots of different challenges and dimensions to it in terms of multi-jurisdictions and all the laws and regulations that go with that. Uh, Lizzie or Amy, anything to add to that? We're um, probably similar, like we're, we're trying to figure out the, um, I mean, we're all in Ireland now, um, but as we look to expand, like our next, our next geography will be the US and then, you know, how do we, the employment contracts are totally different. So for us, it is, it's a, like a multi-country, how do we make sure that we're complying with all the different regulations and then how do we like manage across the team and what are our best practices? How do we make sure that we're, we're kind of staying relevant and um, up to date and all the best practices in multiple countries? So I think it's gonna get more complex for us as we grow. We're still small enough that it's not too bad, thank goodness. But um, yeah, we anticipate kind of similar, um, similar HR issues. Yeah. Uh, this question for me, uh, do, uh, do, do I see organizations like Investec facilitate investing in social enterprise where, the, where there can be a triple bottom line, people, planet and profit? Uh, yeah, yeah, I, I do. And, and I think the, 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 the crisis is, is, is likely, to, I think, to accelerate the interest of large corporations in their, 
uh, and, in, and investor, professional investors in terms of their uh, corporate and social responsibility. Um, we're already seeing that in terms of the, the, the trend towards um, uh, you know, East, you know, uh, ESG um, uh, uh, investing. And I think that's going to, that whole trend is going to you know, continue. And uh, I think if the crisis has, has sort of brought anything to bear, it's just the interdependence of business and wider society. And uh, it is not a question of living off society. It is living as part of it and contributing back to it. So I think that is going to be yeah, uh, something that we will, you know, thankfully, you know, see, uh, see more of. Um, uh, question for Candice. Do you think that Milo would be easiest to to start up in hospitals as they'd be more used to machinery than in the family home. So hospital environment versus domestic environment. <laughs> um, it, it depends on what the use is and where the urgency is. Um, uh, there's that whole fear I have back in Canada, we have this phrase that you could be a jack of all trades, master of none. So we didn't want to go into here and there and everywhere. We wanted to be able to focus really well on, on doing one thing. And for, for me personally, that was to support people in their homes. We, we found that that was an easier uptake. Um, it was something that we could monitor very well. It was something that we could learn from very well. We're only now starting to work with hospitals. We first started working actually with occupational therapists in hospitals who are considering Milo as a resource for some of their patients or their, their outpatients. In hospitals, yeah, they're used to the machinery but the HSC is a, is a large organization and it's not like you can rock up to their reception with a robot and be like, hello, would you like to try Milo? So it, it is a little bit difficult there, but if anyone has any ideas, just send me a message, I'll, I'm all ears. Um, and this is probably one that could go to either Lizzie or, or Amy. Both of you seem to call out the importance of having a co-founder in the, in the business. Um, would it have been impossible on your own or was just having that having that partner by your side on the on the whole startup journey um, just cr really critical lizzie do you want to go first sure yeah i um i sort of knew i there's i'm not i need a co-founder like i need someone that i can bounce ideas off of that will say like like we can confirm things together and double check and make sure that you know we have we have both such different strengths um i definitely don't think that i would be here without my co-founder and and i kind of knew that going into it that that i wanted a, a business partner i didn't want to kind of go it alone Amy? yeah so i'm absolutely the same um i think uh going down the entrepreneurship route can be a lonely journey. There's a lot of stress on your shoulders. It's, uh, there is a lot of pressure. There's a lot of decisions you have to make. And when you have someone there who you can figure things out together, you can, you can really, you know, go through these big challenges, these big stressful moments together. It really does create that level of support that I don't think I would have been able for without him. I've also been very lucky with my co-founder in the sense that he brings so much other than just this decision making process like he is so phenomenal in so many ways that i'm not and i think that really meant that we could balance each other out um it's also just great to have someone there like going through it all with you i think it's a really good thing to do okay we've we've time just for one last qu uh, question and candace maybe and uh, and you've milo there beside you um, there's a lot of, of, of fear uh, abroad of um, uh, artificial intelligence and robotics, and you were saying that robots are already here. But you know, is, do you think that fear is misplaced, that, that you know, AI isn't going to just take, you know, create a, a massive displaced workforce? Um, is there, you know, or should we just be, you know, instead of you know, being concerned, you know, should we just be looking to embrace the change and, and uh, you know, find ways to accelerate? Wow, thanks, thanks for that. Um, not, it's, it's not an easy position. Um, people have, many people, or, or almost most, have a distorted vision of AI and what it is and what it can do, but we've not actually seen it in commercial use yet. Not true AI that can make decisions outside of if parameters by itself. Milo responds to commands. Milo responds to actions that we program into him. And I think... I, as, as someone who builds robots, I've always been leaning towards 
the idea of a fourth industrial revolution where we're not going to need to work as much or as hard or the same way. And I almost think that this pandemic is pushing us towards that. We're all realizing we don't, don't need to be at our office for nine hours a day. We don't need to commute that far each day. We don't need to do a lot of these tasks. And then the more we can automate, the better we can use them. In the service industry that we're, we're using Milo in, such as in people's homes, we're not replacing people. We can't. But the issue we're having is there's not enough people to give the care that we need as a society, as a country, or as the Western world. We have an aging population and we don't have people going into care as a vocation enough to fill that gap. So we're going to have to start using automation. He can't replace a person. He's not going to lift people. He's not going to do that. But he can make sure that someone at home is safer, that if they fall down, that you're going to know about it. You're going to get a video chat on your phone. He can make sure that someone is taking their medication, that someone is doing their daily living, and that someone does not feel alone. So we're not replacing people, but I think this pandemic is pushing us towards thinking more about what we want our lives to be like, and maybe AI needs to play a bigger part of that, or at least automation in some degree. Okay. Thank you, and uh, that's uh, end of the q and I think. Michael, back to you. Thank you, Liam and Candice for your amazing, amazing stories and also for answering how you are all facing different aspects and challenges in your respective industries. It was particularly inspiring to hear how Trinity has played a role in all three of your personal journeys and your companies. Um, I'm just going to briefly share my screen now with everybody. I have a couple of things to wrap up on. Uh, on the screen, you will see a link to all three speakers' companies' websites, and I would encourage you to check them out to learn more about them all. You will also see below that a link to the Trinity Business Alumni website, tva.ie, which I encourage you all to check out. And we want to thank the Trinity Business Alumni and Liam Booth again for their participation in hosting tonight's webinar. Um, on the website, there is a Get Involved section that we encourage you to check out if you're interested in seeing more events from the TBA. The TBA is open to all alumni. You don't have to have been a business graduate. You just have to be interested in or involved in the business world and they throw a suite of events throughout the year that are all worth attending. Below that, you'll also see the upcoming webinar next week, which we're very excited to announce, entitled The New Abnormal, The Future of Work After COVID-19. And that will be with guest speaker Edwina Fitzmaurice, the Chief Commercial Officer at EY in New York. And that will be taking place next Wednesday on May 6th at 7.30 p.m. Dublin time. So the same day and the same time as this evening. This webinar was recorded and will be available to view on our YouTube channel shortly, as well as in our Saved Videos Facebook page, as well as all previous Inspiring Ideas at Webinars, Inspiring Ideas at Trinity webinars. And we would encourage you to check those out if you haven't done so already. Thank you again to all the attendees and thank you to all my coworkers who made tonight possible. It's been a real privilege being a part of this series and we look forward to welcoming you all next week. Thank you and good night. <laughs>